or on his computer. Okay, so um, it's the last lecture. So, so far we've been, well, if you, okay. Beginning of lab 13, you're gonna be doing some analog and digital conversion. We already talked about that in lecture, right? There's also some digital to analog conversion that has to happen in your successive uh, uh, approximate uh, successive approximation registry ADC, right? That's the idea where every time you guess what the answer is, and then and then you convert that digital signal back into an analog, and then you compare it again, and then and then you figure out, oh, I'm too high, so you can convert that analog signal back to digital and then convert it back, and then you just approximate over and over and over again, right? So that's the idea of the successive approximation ADC. So that allows you to do analog to digital conversion on your breadboard, but in order for a lot of this data to be useful, we want to either store it on a computer, right? That way someone else can analyze it, or at least you know send it to the computer so you can actually see what the data looks like. And this is what we're gonna do with the second half of the ADC lab that you guys are working on this week for lab 13, okay? So um, the computer interfacing, the idea is that you wanna be able to store or do more complex calculations with the data versus just doing it on the breadboard, right? Where, you know, just to add two numbers together is kind of complicated, right? So um, the digital output that you're going to make with your ADC 0805, which is the chip you're going to use on the breadboard mm -hmm. itself, right? You can actually plug those digital outputs, outputs directly. Oh, no, it does make sense. You can plug those outputs directly into the input of a computer, okay? And these are generally called general purpose input and output. So you can actually buy a little chip, uh, a little USB interface that has just a bunch of prongs on it, you can actually put those input in your computer if you want, okay? Um, on the BASIS board, right? These are actually the same port that you've been using to look at your trigger, your clocks, and your audio output from lab 12, right? We can just plug into here and actually see the pulses coming out, right? You can see your pulse with modulation stuff there. So, but there is a special port on the lower left-hand side here, um, if you actually zoom in, you can actually see this is actually labeled JX ADC because the this one is called like JA, this one is called JB, this one is called JC, right? But this one has a special name. It's actually the JX ADC port where it has an ADC attached to it. So it directly connects to the ADC that's inside your FPGA. You can even see this right here because this is labeled number three. Number three is the analog signal PMOD, which is, you know, what these interf interfaces, connector for the XADC, okay? So this ADC um, is actually better than the one, better than the, uh, the 805, okay? It can do 12-bit conversions, right? Four more bits than your, than your uh, 805. And it can do a million conversions per second, okay? Um, those of you who remember, um, the 805 can only do about 10,000 uh, conversions per second. So it's about 100 times faster and converts four more bits, okay? So it's more accurate also, okay? So it's just a much better ADC. Um, that's because when you just kind of uh, design these on your FPGA, it's just a lot faster, okay? As opposed to just, you know, having a bunch of wires around. So we can write the... We can write a module to do this ADC stuff using this PMOD and then convert those digital signals onto to, to display on, let's say the display on your BASIS board, right? Because there's numbers here you can say, oh, you know, two volt, three volts, five volts, stuff like that, okay? Okay, but what we're gonna do is take advantage of this last lab to teach you one more thing about uh, Vivado or any other, you know, FPGA programming software, okay? So this is known as the IP catalog. IP stands for intellectual property, okay? So these are stuff that's not made by you, but you can use, uh, well, some of them are free, some of them are not. So if you go to your uh, Vivado homepage, home screen, okay? 
on the top left, there's actually a button that I never tell you to push, and hopefully you never pushed it before this point, right, called the IP catalog, okay? The IP catalog is basically a bunch of modules that other people have written, okay? Mostly, mostly written by people who are actually much better and at, at writing uh, FPGA modules than us. Okay, some of them are free, some of them cost per use. Okay, um, you can think about it as kind of like an app store for the FPGA. So some of them, some of the stuff you can buy, some of those you can you can use for free. If you click on this IP catalog window, what you're going to see is you're going to see a, a search window that comes up in your main screen. This is where your top module usually is, right? It pops up here, and it's just a list of all these other stuff, okay? So there's some uh, alliance partners, audio connectivity, so you can do, like, the, the the pulse with modulation stuff is probably in here, right? Some automotive and industry stuff, if you want to work on cars and stuff like that, how to program FPGAs for those. A um, bunch of stuff, right? Um, the one we're going to be wanting to use in this case is the XADC. Right, let me scroll up, right? So XADC is the JXADC that's actually on the BASIS 3 board. So if you just type in the search box, type XADC, only one of them will come up, which is surprising because usually there's like so many of these written. But on this little window here, right? The uh, IP itself is called XADC wizard. So hopefully that's like a mate, make it so it's easy to use. Um, there's AXI4. This is actually the a pro um, FPGA convention for interfacing things on a computer. So don't worry too much about it. But the, the, the important thing is that whether or not the license is cost, price per you know use, price per license, right? But if it says included, that means it's included in the package already. So you don't have to pay for it. And we're only going to use the free ones, right? Because we're not going to pay for stuff, um, especially for students to use, right? Because we don't we don't need to. So, because a lot of these modules, because they they range from like ten bucks per use to like ten thousand dollars per use, okay, depending on how complicated they are. Okay. Um, and what type of application? Okay, so if you're making stuff for the military, then they charge they charge more for that. Um. Okay. Once you found this uh, little IP that you want to use, you just double click on it. When you double click on it, it brings up the customized IP window, okay? It starts off extremely complicated, right? Actually, there's a lot more buttons in every, uh, in every way, but we're gonna simplify this by just taking a single channel and doing a 12-bit ADC on a single channel, okay? And then if you calculate two to the 12, it actually gives you uh, 4,096 levels of voltages that you can measure, which is much more than we need, okay? And the lab will actually take you through, you know, how to customize it, okay? So I'm not gonna go through it here because there's just a lot of button clicking and check this, click on that, and then put in this number, okay? Okay, once you customize the IP, okay, what's gonna happen is that you click okay, and then a window will pop up and says, generate, okay? The reason it has to get generated is because it's basically generating the FP, the Verilog code that you could have written yourself, but you didn't because you already know this exists, right? So you don't want to write uh, something that's that's already been written, okay? But you don't get to see the code itself, okay? It generates the code, but it hides it from you, okay? And this is the way they preserve their intellectual property, right? And that way you can't just copy and paste your code and just start selling it to someone else, okay? But what you do get is the instantiation template. Remember when you write a module, right? You write it on the bottom of the file and then there's a bunch of stuff in there, right? Afterward, in your top module, you have to instantiate it, right? Okay. So each of these IP, if you go to the source files for these things, instead of giving you the module itself, it gives you this VEO file, this is the template that you can use for uh, Verilog. The VHO file is for is the template for VHDL, okay, in case you're programming for Intel, okay? Um, so when you open this template, 
So you basically see something like this. Okay. It looks a little bit different from what you're used to instantiating because it's using this thing called a dot notation. Okay. The dot notation allows you to um, actually before I talk about dot notation, is that before when you create a um, a module, let me write it up here. Okay. Right, when you make a module, say the slow clock, input clock output. When you instantiate that, right, you have to put the input clock first and then the output clock second, right? It has to be the right order. Okay. But what this dot notation allows you to do is you can put things in in any order you want, as long as you put the dot notation stuff in front of it. Unfortunately, the stupid line is here. <laughs> so, for example, up here, the first input is DIN, which is digital input in. Okay. It's the, it says it twice. But the way they wrote the module is they put a, instead of just putting clock, they put dot clock. Parentheses clock here. Okay. And that way you can actually tell the module which variable you're talking about. Okay. So, of course, DIN will correspond with the DIN variable. Right. Let's uh, pick another one. Let's do uh, uh, alarm out. Right. Alarm out corresponds to the alarm out in the, in, in the code itself. But you just put a dot in front of it. So, that dot indicates which variable it is. Okay, and this is how it's actually going to be referenced inside the uh, inside the module. Okay, so when you instantiate this, right? Let's say I did this completely correct. This. Okay. Instantiate this. Like let's say I wrote I wrote the module out correctly, right? When you instantiate it, you do slow clock. Slow clock. Okay. Instead of having to remember which order to put things in, I can just say, well, I want the slow clock to be this. Right. And then I want the uh, input clock to be this. Ah, can't spell. So you can put put in any word you want now. Okay. This is useful because, right, when you hide your module code from people, right, you can't show them this lining, right? So this is, has to happen in order for you to tell people, okay, if you want to put in your clock, you put your slow clock here, and you put your fast clock here, right? Okay, makes sense why they have to do that. It's also easier, right? Now you don't have to keep track of which order things are in, right? Okay, so this is a long list of stuff that that will allow you to instantiate your XADC module. Okay, you can name that instance whatever you want. In fact, I'm gonna name mine my ADC or my XADC, right? So whatever you want to call it, you can call it Ken's, uh, Francisco's, if you want, but my seems to work, right? Okay. Instantiate this, right? You're going to have a bunch of inputs that you need to prepare beforehand. So, of course, you're going to want some digital out, right? Because this is an analog to digital converter, right? So, the output is going to be a bunch of digital signal that you have to take care of, right? So, of course, this DO stands for digital out, out, right? It's worth the out twice. Okay. Um, other stuff you have to prepare for is that these the XADC allows you to do multi-channel input, multi-channel output. So unfortunately, that means what you need to do is just declare a bunch of channel out that you're not going to use. So this is a four, five-bit output channel that you're not going to use, but you're using only the first one. Okay. Uh, what else is up there? Um, oh, EOC out. EOC out. EOC stands for N of conversion. Okay. Um, because what you want to do when the ADC is doing stuff, right? It's gonna take like 12 clock, 15 clock, 70 clock, 
I think it's going to take 100 clock with this ADC to convert. You want that signal to come out to tell whatever you're using after, right? To say, oh, the conversion is ready. Now read out the digital output, right? Otherwise, it's not going. No one's going to know when the when the output is ready to go, right? Because it takes multiple clock cycle for the conversion to happen, right? Uh, what else is there? I think that's it. Okay. Anyway, so the lab is going to take you through why each of these are the way they are. Okay. Some of these are actually switches, so you can actually reset the ADC if you need to manually. Um, some of them are just the regular clocks. Some of them are LEDs to just tell you, you know, what is happening on the uh, on the ADC. And then at first, part C of the lab is just going to have you output the uh, the values to the hex display again. Okay, it's just going to go up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay, you're not going to send that to the computer yet. Okay. One th one thing to note is that the PMOT input, the little pin inputs on your Basis board, the full range of input on it can be from zero to 3.3 volts, okay? If you put anything above 3.3 volts on it, you're just gonna fry that particular port, so don't do that. Um, this ADC is designed so the input is gonna be from zero to one volt, okay? It cannot take negative inputs. Um, it can not take any inputs bigger than one volt, okay? So what you're gonna do is that I'm um, gonna set your function generator. Hopefully you remember how I use it. I haven't used it for a long time, right? Function generator to make a sine wave that has an amplitude of five volts and an offset of 0.5 volts, okay? So you have a wave that's coming in, right? Um, you may need to um, set the offset a little bit higher because there could be a slightly different ground between the function generator and the, the basis board. So, so start with this, but then what happened is that if it looks like it's trying to do this instead, where it's being zero a lot, then you're gonna see that, okay, I'm gonna shift the, um, the input up a little bit just so that um, we're, we're at the same ground, okay? So that's dealing with the ADC on the FPGA using this IP catalog thing. Okay, so it's also something new that I'm teaching you guys. So, you know, don't be scared. Okay, it'll, it'll work some at some point. Okay. <laughs> Any questions about that? How you, what the process is at least, right? So you're gonna pick your intellectual property, customize it, okay? And then you're gonna look at the template, the instantiation template, and you're gonna just kind of tweak the instantiation template for your own use, okay? Good? All right, so everyone can do this lab by themselves, right? Just kidding. <laughs> okay, so the other part of this lecture is gonna be on computer interfacing. So all of this ADC is for not, unless you can save this data, right, onto a computer, okay? So we're gonna use, there's multiple ways to interface with the computer. This is not the only way. This is the, let's say the easiest for me to understand way. There are other methods that I don't understand, but then I can just type in the IP catalog and it'll just do it for me. But <laughs> this is the way that I can explain to you, okay? The other ones, I don't know how to explain it. So it's, it's more complicated, okay? Like ethernet and and like USB beyond 1.0, that's a little bit harder for me to explain, okay? The o OUSB I can explain, but this, this is, yeah. The USB 2.0 and USB-C is like multi-channel. It's not serial anymore to me, so, so I can't really explain it. So if you're interested in reading more about serial communication, there's the Spark Fun page. Um, if you want the link to it, I can also post it on Canvas. And the idea is that you have some electronic device, you know, you can pretend this is a breadboard. In our case, this is gonna be in the FPGA basis board, right? You connect that through a USB, it should be able to send the information into your computer somehow, right? Hopefully that makes sense. And what we're gonna use is universal asynchronous receiver and transmit transmitter. This is known as UART. A lot of physicists use this because it's simple, okay? It's simple to explain, it's not, um, it's like the, you know, level zero of computer interfacing, okay? It's not that fast, but it's fast enough for us, 
Okay. The idea is that, well, you have some device on the left. So this will be your breadboard or your FPGA board. You have some interface chip called UART, okay, universal asynchronous uh, receiver and transmitter. You're going to need to build a UART on the computer side and send, and that's going to receive the signal from your device and then record that on computer. So this is your device. This is your computer, okay? It could be that way. It doesn't matter, right? Because they're both uh, symmetric in their um, relationship, okay? So this can, you know, take eight bits of information and it's going to send it, right? TX stands for the transmission line. RX stands for the receive, receiver line. Of course, the transmission on the device goes to the receiver on the other device, right? You don't want the transmission to go to transmission, right? It's just two people talking to each other. No one's listening to each other, right? So that's why there's always this crossover. Those of you who are my age, when I was a kid, there's this thing called crossover cable that you have to buy in order to play video games with your friend. So that's what that, that's about, okay? Um, I didn't understand at the time, but that's why you have a crossover cable because you need to put all the senders to the receiver and the receiver to the sender, okay? Okay, and UART has, the idea of the cool thing about UART is that the sender and the receiver does not have to share a clock, meaning my computer can run on a, you know, 100 megahertz clock, and then your fastest board can run on a 500 megahertz clock. That's okay, right? But what you do have to agree on is the bot rate, okay? And this bot rate is just basically how many times per second do we measure sending, how many, how many times per second do we send and receive? 300 bot means the computer, the device and the computer will do 300 things at a per second, okay? So it's not that fast, okay? It actually goes up about to about, an, about a million. I think that's as fast as um, UART can go, okay? And when you set the UART, essentially what you're setting is actually the time between send and receive, time, send and receive, okay? So um, if you set it to 300, there'll be 3.33 milliseconds between between each data, uh, data point, okay? And then if you set it to, what's typical is actually this uh, 115,000 uh, bot rate, which is very, which basically like all devices these days can handle and it's fast enough so that, you know, you can send some decent amount of data on it, okay? So you can send about 144, uh, sorry, 14,000 bytes, bytes, meaning eight bits of uh, information left and right, okay? This typ typically people will use um, 115K, okay? Anything faster, it, you know, it has to be like the newest operating system and stuff like that. So typically people will just use this by default. We're gonna use 300 because we wanna do things slow so you can actually see it happening, okay? So how does UART send this data? It's actually a serial interface. So both device agrees on the format of the data that's going to be sent back and forth. Okay. The first bit is known as the start bit. Okay. Um, when you you can actually physically measure this on your USB. Okay. When you set up on UART, when there's nothing happening, the voltage is going to be on high. Okay, for USB, uh, uh, micro USB interface, that's 3.3 volts. Okay, what's going to happen is that when any of the device wants to start sending stuff, it pulses low. So it looks for a downward slope, okay, downward slope trigger, and that starts the information. Okay, it waits one frame, sorry, one frame, one frame, okay, and then it pulses a bunch of data, okay. The way it knows it's going to end, okay, it's going to send a stop voltage across it. And typically, this is like two to actually like two to three stop. I don't know why they will broke one and two here, where it just pulses high for like three clock, three cycles. And then, therefore, the, the receiver knows, okay, you're done talking now. I can, I can go back to doing nothing. Okay. There's also this parity bit. The idea of a parity bit is that it tells you. 
Okay. Let's say you're you're sending. Ooh, this is where the pen will come in useful. Let's say I'm sending. Okay, one zero zero one. Okay, this is an odd number, right? Okay, it's an odd number. Okay, what you can do is you can apply even parity correction. Okay, so whenever the um, the sender is sending an odd number, it just tags an extra one to it. Okay to add to that odd number to make it always even, okay? So the sender knows that, okay, I have an odd number, so I'm gonna tag one to it to, to, to make sure it's even, okay? And this bit tells the receiver, okay, is this number supposed to be odd or even, okay? If it's even, then there's always gonna be a one to it. If it's odd, there's always gonna be a zero, okay? And that way, it knows at least when there's one bit that gets flipped, let's say this bit got flipped, Right, then actually can correct for it. Okay, it's a it's a minor correct. You know, it corrects things. It's better than no correction. Okay, <laughs> that's all I can say. Okay, because if two bits flip, then you're screwed. Right. Okay. Um. All right. So for example, all right, this is the one with no uh, uh parity bits. Okay. So let's say I'm sending. Actually, I need to write this down because this is actually backward. Okay, let's say I'm sending zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 one. Okay, what I need to do is send the least significant bit first. Okay, so you have you have your start bit, which is the clock, the the pulse going to to zero. That tells the other computer that oh, I'm ready to send stuff. Be ready for the next thing. Okay. You send the least significant bit. You, next one, next one, next one, next one, next one, next one. And then you do a stop. And usually this is not just one. It's actually like three pulses that goes high. You just tell the other computer, okay, nothing's going on. So you know, be ready for something else. Okay. Um so so like written up here is backward from what you would normally write that a binary number with, okay? Because everything has to be sent. Uh, kind of like least significant bit first. So you're sending this out first, this out first, right? Right. Last, right? Uh, but you, yeah, question? A bunch of ones. Yeah. Um, so, Serial frames, they're designed to only handle about like nine bits and they're just a very low chance. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't actually. So you don't want to send like, you don't want to use this to send like two bit information because that's going to be confusing, right? And you also don't want to use this to send like 16 bit information. So that's why there's like, like the optimal range that this kind of works, okay? Okay, so once again, you can write this module yourself, do all the shift registry. This is um, lab 11, right? You did a shift registry that allows you to shift these bits and have it output one at a time, right? Okay. And then program, you know, the start bit, the, the stop bits and all that stuff, okay? But since we're playing around with the IP catalog log this week, so I'll just show, I'll just, we'll just use the IP catalog um, you would think that, oh, if I, you know, search UART, then I will find it. Um, but um, that one is actually not free. Um, so I'm going to, I found a free one. Um, it's called, it's actually a general purpose microcontroller. A microcontroller can do UART. You can program a microcontroller to do this, okay? To basically just, it's one of the functionality of it, okay? It's a... It's a little chip, you know, when, you, when people before FPGA think about microcontroller, it's a little chip that can do some manipulation. That's it, okay? You just think about it like that, okay? So we can make this micro blaze microcontroller to do the UART for, for us, okay? It's not its only functionality, it can do UART, okay? So even down here it says, you know, 
uh, for something for peripheral for debugging UR, you know, it has UR in the description. That's how I found it. Okay. So the lab was going to take you through how to customize this IP. So we won't go through that, right? Because so just you just have to click that. Oh, I want to make this uh, microcontroller into a UART controller. Okay. So uh, once again, you go to the VEO file to find the Verilog instantiation template, right? Just as you did with the uh, XADC. Okay. Once you instantiate the UART. It's actually done. So all the hardware stuff is basically done, right? So once you once you actually um, create the bit, bit stream for it and then program your device, what's going to happen is that your USB is going to be start pulsing in data, pulsing out data, sorry. So how do we know this is working, right? So typically what will, what will happen is that someone or you is going to have to program the computer to read out that port constantly, okay? All right. so this is gonna take a little bit of software development. This is not a software development class, so the lab is gonna take you step-by-step step on how to do it. But I just kind of wanna walk through the steps and therefore when you do it in the lab, you actually have an idea why you're doing each of these steps, okay? Okay, so Siling actually comes with the software development kit, which should be on your computers also, okay? So uh, if you're interested in learning more about the sophomore development kit, you know, you can, this is like a 200 page long document. You can, you can read through all of that. And that's actually doesn't even teach you everything about it. Okay. So there's just so much stuff you can do. Um, so this software development, you can either program in C or C++. A lot of times I can't even tell the difference at this very basic level. Okay. So don't worry. It's not going to force you to do a lot of programming. I just expect you to copy and paste the code. Okay. Okay, so what happened is that the first thing you need to do is export the hardware profile of your FPGA. What does that mean? Okay, so your FPGA has the XADC on it, right, and the micro blaze UART stuff on it, right? The software needs to know what to expect that stuff to output, right? Right, you need to know what the hardware is in order for the software to know what they what to expect as the input, right? Okay, so this export, right, it's pretty simple. You just export the hardware. It's kind of cool. I didn't know this is something that existed before I, uh, I started teaching this class. Okay, when you export the hardware, it's going to show up as something hardware platform. Okay, in my case. Okay, up here, oops, here it is. It's called top module hardware platform because I call my top module top module, right? So it's good. you're gonna see that name, you know, it could be Ken's module, it could be Dylan's module, right? Okay, once you export the, uh, the hardware, you can actually, so the exporting happened in Vivado, right, on the FPGA software, but once you export it, you can open it in the software development program as a piece of hardware, and it shows up over here, okay? Once you have the hardware show up over here, what you wanna do is just write, you know, some simple code in order for you to, I think in this case, it just prints out the data, okay? You can have also program it to write the data to a file. You can, you can write a code that automatically makes plots for you if you want. You can program it to send it to your mom, or that would be hard. <laughs> you can have it automatically sent to whoever you want. Okay, you can spam people with it, right? But you probably get blacklisted pretty soon, pretty quick. Anyway, so how do I write that software for that? Okay, so what you need to do in order to have that software is you need to create a new project, okay? In a lot of programming, there's also this idea of a pro so you have your hardware project which is on Vivado, and you have your software project which is on SDK. Okay, so you I created a new software project. You know I'm just gonna call it my DAC. The reason I call it DAC is that this is actually the completion of a data acquisition system. Okay, you have some data on your, let's say your um your speaker or your light sensor your temperature sensor, whatever it is, you can read that out through the ADC, convert it to digital, okay? 
and send it to a computer, right? That's a way to just act with acquired data, okay? This is, so we're actually showing you how to make a complete data acquisition system. Okay, so this data acquisition system is gonna call it my DAC. Um, a lot of stuff is just default. I mean, technically I, do, I don't even know how to code in C, but the code is so simple that I can just, it's the same as C++. <laughs> so if you prefer C++, you can check C++, but the code is pretty simple, okay? What this will do is, is once again, it's gonna create a template for you, okay? This template is gonna be called Hello World. Um, anyone have taken a programming class? Is that the first program you always write, right? Because that's the, the famous Hello World program, okay? So if you haven't done it, that's okay. That's just like a template program that everybody writes the first time they take a programming class, okay? What we're gonna do, okay? I'm gonna provide you with a file called hello world.c also. You just have to copy that code and paste, then replace everything. Um, I think not everything. I think like from this line on down, okay? It's just gonna replace everything there, okay? Okay. Um, we don't have to understand most of this stuff. It's just kind of setting up the general input output stuff. But the thing that what it does is that it's gonna print out whatever the increments of data is, and then also the data itself. Okay, what it, this is like the number of, this is not my sex actually, it's not in seconds. Uh, this is the number of um, sections, I don't know. I, I should have changed this name. <laughs> Okay, this is the basically the, the sampling numbers. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And the data itself is the one that comes out of the ADC. Okay. And it's gonna convert that to decimal for you. Okay. So once you do this copy and paste, you hit the save button up here, which is grayed out right now. But uh, if you make changes to code, it'll ungrade. And if you as soon as you hit save. Um, the SDK will actually automatically compile the code for you. If it compiles it successfully, you're going to get this at the bottom in the console. So that's the top of the screen. This is the bottom. Okay. There'll be this nice blue font that says, you know, build finish. And it finished building this thing called mydac.elf. Okay. We're going to be making a bunch of elves. Okay. It's not even Christmas yet. Right. So elf actually stands for executable linkable file. Okay, and the reason we need that is because we need to tell the hardware where to send the stuff, right? We tell the software where to look for stuff. We need to tell the hardware where to send the stuff, okay? So we need both ends to cooperate in order for this to happen, okay? So once you create the ELF file, you go back to Vivado. So Vivado deals, deals with the hardware stuff, right? SDK deals with the software stuff, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to associate the ELF to our FPGA, okay? So this tell the FPGA what software we are sending the data to, okay? Okay, once you've got both sides talking to each other, right? right? That means the hardware and the software are set up, and then you can actually use the SDK terminal. You don't have to use this. There are other terminal uh, on port monitoring system, but it has one built in already, so you might as well use it. So if you open uh, for my computer is COM port six, I think for some of your computers COM port four, you just have to pick which one is the correct one. Okay. What happened is that the data will just kind of start. Because remember when as soon as you program your device, this thing is just going to start sending data, right? As soon as you um, take care of your software and your and your and your hardware interface, it's just going to start sending out numbers. Okay. Right. In my case, I was just having it send a sine wave. So this is actually data that's coming out of my FPGA from the function generator. So you can tell that it's actually a sine wave. Okay. I mean, if this was, you know, it's like music, right? This will be more irregular, right? This was a microphone or, or light from a folded multiplier or your temperature sensor or, you know, I don't know, spin of a squeaky chair, whatever. <laughs> you can measure whatever you want, right? Okay. And then record it onto a computer and then do whatever fancy analysis you want on it, okay? All right, any questions? So that's all I have, and that should get you through lab 13.